Hello, we're Everything Everything. We're going to go through our album Man Alive with you, track by track, hopefully give you some inside knowledge about where the songs come from and what they're about, how we recorded them. The first one's called Mike Ease, Your Boyfriend. Quite an old demo I made in a, a sort of R&B pastiche style um, that we then took to the studio, changed around quite a lot with the producer David Coston. It's one of the first things we did with it. was the first thing we did with him, and it's one of the main reasons we came back to him because of how successful it was. There's two different types of America where you have a very superficial sort of sitcom world, like Friends environment, which is based on very self-absorbed uh, realities about how you feel about everything. And there's also the foreign policy of, you know, killing people in foreign lands for whatever reason and thinking about how those two things can coexist at the same time and trying to superimpose one on the other and have, have the sitcom folk acting in that very self-absorbed way while missiles are raining down and thinking how, how much that would pale into insignificance if it was happening, um, basically. Um, I was thinking about how now the place we live, you know, the times we live in is, is very dominated by the Western world, English speakers or Europeans, and thinking about a symbol of their kind of technological domination is the QWERTY keyboard, because obviously you don't use it in China. And I was thinking about how those countries are coming, you know, China's on the ascent while America's possibly on the, you know, plateau and thinking about in a few hundred or thousand years or whatever it's going to take, the time of the, of the QWERTY keyboard user, the QWERTY finger would be over, QWERTY finger no more, and you know, we'd be onto something else and thinking about ages of people, epochs of time, and our one, my one, is to be a QWERTY finger and I'm part of this thing which is dominant and how that feels when you think about Africa, you think about China in the future. Schooling is using the basis of sort of modern American R and B, which musically we're pretty fascinated by. Um, the drums are quite Brazilian the, the as rhythm, well. Yeah, there were there were some Brazilian drums in there that we actually mm. hired in for for a couple of days in the studio to give it all that kind of tropical flavour, I suppose. Um, and so we're kind of aping that style and at the same time, not really managing it. So it comes out with its own slant on it, you know, which makes it sound like everything, everything, I suppose. And it's basically, as we often do, kind of two fairly mismatched bits of music smashed together. Um, learning, essentially, um, anything from learning about from mistakes you make in your personal life, which is what I was thinking about a lot of the time, whether you ever really learn from things or whether I do, and learning on a more grand scale of, you know, just the ape coming down from the trees and learning to become a human. Essentially about guilt or about kind of uh, white guilt or kind of Anglo-Saxon guilt and or on a smaller level just how things people, your forefathers may have done can reflect on you even before you're born and trying to sort of escape that really. Baseline the chorus over the chords that Alex had produced literally as it went down, and I don't think I did another take after that. So it's got a slightly loping, unsure style of itself in the courses, which I quite like. Mm -hmm. so I love that. Sort of laid actually. back, sort of hip hop feel, which yeah. is really nice. Um, so, so with that for all of us, we were, we were literally improvising on the spot and trying to, trying to nail it. And we did, I think. It's probably, it's probably one of the, probably maybe the only song that has a sort of real, like everybody seems to have a part in writing that song, mm. you know, and it seems very sort of equally measured in, in ways in between the four years. And it does sound different to a lot of our songs, it's got, it's, it's, the focus isn't so much on kind of, here's the singer, here's the sort of vocal, and you know, it's all very sort of, I don't know, it's, it's, it's more laid back in a lot of ways, it's, you can sort of nod your head to it in a way you can't to a lot of our songs, and it's kind of cooler, really. Mm. It's sort of darker and cooler and, and more laid back.
Photoshop Shop Handsome was a single for us, the second single we did. It's about a year and a half ago now, um, really. No, and no, no, no. it was probably the first time we ever used synths, I think, in a song. Um, we, we, we sort of reimagined it with synths. Um, it went through a different stages of being a kind of more traditional four-piece guitar band sound, and then we stripped it down as sort of three-piece guitar band sound. It was quite a lot like Smiths or Blur. And then we put synths back into it that had come off the original demo, and we listened to Jonathan's original bedroom demo. It was kind of quite slow and day. sort of New Jack swing. It was like, it reminded me of PJ and Duncan, actually. It had yeah. a one-note bass line. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and just took the synths off that, basically, and stuck it onto this newer sort of slightly more jangly pop version that we'd, mm. we'd developed as a band. It's sort of one of the only tracks that has got a real sort of party, young, It's got the four feel. to the floor thing, which yeah. and it, by and large we don't and have. Yeah, and I think it just really holds its own the record has the same place. It's yeah, place. it's something that we're very comfortable with and we've played an awful lot of times. Um, it's, I really enjoy it live. It's, yeah. it's a real peak in the set for us. Decent, Two for Nero, that was a song we hadn't actually planned to do at all. It was a demo that I made a while ago that we played. We, we played did actually. Sort of like encore. We did, yeah, and we kind of we drifted out of playing it because we couldn't. I couldn't really sing it because it was too high, and it was we never really found the right appropriate place it's, to play it's just it. It's got this amazing sound where John's sort of using he's singing sort of three of his voice sort of carried the whole song all the way through. Almost. It's very, very, very stripped down. It's just one harpsichord line yeah. that, that doesn't even play chords. It's literally just a line um, for the first sort of two and a half minutes or even longer than that and just a very sort of exposed vocal. Um, but it sort of builds towards this point. You don't know what's going to happen, if it's going to crash into something in the usual everything, everything way, but it doesn't. It actually, it's very subtly sort of breaks and it's completely improvised. We just recorded probably three takes of bass, drums and guitar. Alex had never played on the song at all. We just went into the studio, we knew that this break was coming in the song and just recorded Mickey's... Everyone's just improvising. In, it was our first single. It was one of the first things we ever played together, I think. It was, yeah. Um, it was I, kind of structured by, by the four of us. Um, from just a sort of two section loop on your laptop. And yeah. And even though it doesn't really consist of much more than that, it does have a feel of the rise and fall of a normal pop song. It was strange, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd been striving to find songs that I thought were sort of worthy of playing with the band when, we, when I started the band. And that was just something that I thought was a little bit silly that Mickey overheard one day of me playing back on the laptop. And he said, well, what's that? It's really good. And I thought it's just a silly sort of pop thing. I'd never considered we'd actually play it and said, no, no, that's really good. So we converted it to guitars. And um, yeah, that was a learning process for me. It was something I'd always thought, you know, writing pop essentially was, wasn't worth much. And I, that kind of taught me that actually it is. And it, it, we still play it. it we, we fought to put it on the album. And I think it taught me a hell of a lot in terms of, of enjoying music. Um, it's, it's pretty weird though. It's, it's a really weird totally song. It goes along in a kind of disco way um, and then it breaks into these huge sort of metal riffs. Sort of the, probably the biggest and only riff of that sort on the album. An actual sort of guitar riff moment. Julian guitars, kind of silly. Kind of silly, hugely enjoyable. And I think that the um, complexity of the riff itself. It's not, your, it's not your normal stupid riff. It is a big, big stupid riff, but it's, it's quite funky and it's quite interesting. Um, and that kind of makes it into something more, I think, because it, it's not just, let's just do something stupid. It's got this kind of nice... And the fact that we, we have a song where basically the chorus is just a big instrumental <laughs> massive riff is, is quite nice as well, because it doesn't happen elsewhere. And I can't think of many bands that, that would do it. completely different song that we played a long time ago in the early days when we were much more kind of post-punk thing with just guitars and um, we basically took the verse from that and, and its title and its lyrical basis and stuck it onto a, a different song which was originally called Even the Dogs um, because we weren't keen on the verses in that song and we weren't keen on the other bits of Diana so we took the 
the verse which we liked and then stuck it onto all the other bits of this other song. And it took us a long time to get used to that. It took us a long time, yeah. Although to, it doesn't sound like the best way to write songs. It doesn't <laughs> no, at all, it's no. Sort of, it's sort of well, work, it worked we, out. We were hearing from every, everyone around us that this was really great, what we'd done. And, we'd and yet, knowing what we had done by slightly clumsily combining two different, completely unrelated elements, that made us feel really ambivalent about the whole thing. Yeah. I, yeah. We've actually grown to, to really like it again. I yeah. Think. Love there's the sound of the choruses. There's an amazing section, amazing section, where, uh, well, I know it is amazing, and I can say that because we, are, none of us are playing it. There's, uh, we got in a trumpet player to play a part um, yeah. that we'd written, but then we also asked him to improvise, and it, he was absolutely amazing, and it's one of my favourite moments is when he breaks into this sort of flourish towards the end. Um, just really, just really good musician, a really great sound, and really nice little melody just wrote just off the bat. We began dismantling the stadium. As it was on your side was a song we recorded at the same time as recording My Keys of Boyfriend with David Coston about a year ago, which was our first expedition with him. And we wanted to kind of marry the version that we were playing live, which was a sort of slower, Coldplay esque. More worthy. Ugh. Uh, kind of, sort of rock song, anthem. I suppose, anthem. And we were slightly wary that we were maybe the, ori the, the original demo was that. quite a, was quite a f upbeat sort of um, R and B, bubbly, quite sparse thing. thing with very sort of processed sounding drums. And we had this knowledge in our mind. And, but when we played it live, it wasn't happening because we couldn't possibly make that sound. So in the studio, we tried to make Mickey's real drums sound like these very highly processed hip hop drums with a hell of a lot of success I thought and that yeah, was a really one of the major things that we, that we just thought holy sh uh, oh my goodness <laughs> David Coston is going to be the man for this um, because he made the drums sound amazing um, and we, we did this recording and we still thought it sounded a little bit too much like the live band and we had this memory of this very fast demo which actually when we went back to was completely unrealistic but anyway so when, when it came to the album we took this thing we'd done with him and we speeded it up very slightly and we took out some of the kind of more romantic elements of it and tried to make it a bit colder and a bit more sort of like this original demo. And as a result, I think it's really great. Tin the Manhole is a song um, I wrote. It's very simple. It's just a, a repeating motif that I wrote on the guitar, but then I transferred it to a synth. Um, added some string parts and just a very sort of um, just linear, a very wide sort of big synth sound, which doesn't really adhere to any to any sort of musicality really. But well, obviously it's in tune. But uh, and then I wrote the lyrics, all the lyrics on the on a train journey while I was stood up because there were no seats, and I just suddenly started thinking all these things, and I just had to write it all all into my phone, which is completely unheard of for me. I usually sit down and pour over these things and come back to them, come back to them, I wrote the whole thing and more, about twice as many lyrics, just all on this one train journey from Oxford to Manchester. And then uh, recorded it in a very dark bedroom, sort of warehouse conversion that I'd moved into in London. Um, recorded it really badly. And, uh, but there was a certain, I was trying out lots of new things I hadn't before, just using my voice in different ways and just kind of breathing and recording just, just me taking breaths and trying to just get this feel of kind of intimacy that I hadn't really tried to do before and to try and make it a different, very different thing. I felt very differently about this recording and tried to make it, tried to kind of get inside more and I, and I sang low, which I never do. And all these things combined in this very cold, minimal track with this very evocative imagery that had all come to me on this train journey um, resulted in, I don't know, I I don't know, it sounds very different to everything else, certainly. I know I said I wrote the lyrics to Tin on a train. I did actually write Weights on a bus, and these, those are the only two times it's happened, and they're right next to each other in the album. I never ever thought of that. Um, coming home from, from seeing a friend, um, and I started writing this rhythm in my mind, and I started wanting the guitars on the snares and the bass on the, dr on the bass drums. And I got off the bus and just went straight into my house and just put this down, this rhythm, and put 
any old chords on the, on the snares and, and the bass kind of accordingly. And that was kind of the basis of it. And it's got this really strange rhythmic feel, which takes a while to get into, but it's actually quite simple if you kind of just go with it. There's a lyric at the end section I start to sing, I know how it ends, um, but the end part is extremely complicated to play. Um, so we have this kind of very fitting thing going on where I'm constantly singing, I know how it ends, I know what's happening, obviously on a personal, you know, in the meaning of the song, but also on a musical level, you know, we, we know how to do that, you know, we know what's going on, it may sound like the end of the world, but, you know, we're in control, and then uh, the whole chaos cuts away and I'm just left alone, and I don't actually finish the line, um, so, I don't know, asking lots of questions, musically as well as in the lyric, it's it sort of they mirror each other quite well, and of course it ends the album. Yeah.